Hey, Ridge Church, how are you doing? Good to be back with you this morning on a beautiful fall morning, bright and sunny. Well, it was sunny yesterday, cloudy today, but nice 70 degree of weather for the middle part of November. You can't beat that. Can't beat that. And uh, in addition to that, we're starting a new series. Um, today will be our first day, and it's entitled, I've entitled it, Following Jesus. Uh, it's built around discipleship, and I'm hopeful that this series, it's going to be, I think, eight to ten different lessons, but I'm, I'm really hopeful in my heart and prayerful in my heart that what this series does is it, it draws us, you and I, as I study, my heart has been touched already, and I, I pray that your heart would be touched, and it would really cause us to become more followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, the ultimate example that we have in, in Jesus, the Son of God that came, He lived on this earth for 33-ish years without sin. Uh, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to reach that milestone. We're not going to be without sin, but certainly in Jesus, we have somebody to follow uh, to lead us down the paths that we should be walking. And, and so I hope that this series, as we study a, a, from a lot of different viewpoints, I hope that it touches your heart, speaks to your heart, uh, along with mine, and in 10 weeks from now that we can say, man, that was an awesome study, and I feel like I'm closer to the Lord, and I'm following Jesus closer than what I have in my life previously. So that's, that's the goal, and, and we're going to start the, uh, the first lesson this, this morning is based around your relationship with Jesus. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what God means to you. Who is God in your life today? Um, how are you tied to God? You know, what separates us from the Lord? And, and what does that mean when it comes to following Christ, okay? But you know, the thing that we, that we know, the thing that is so critical is that we get that foundation built that says, I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior, and, and how important it is in our perspective to think in that manner, to think on a daily basis of who Christ is, what he has done for you, that gives you the love. I, I love him because he first loved me. And, and I, if I'm going to follow him, it, there's some cost associated with following Christ. It, you know, it's not the natural inclination of the flesh in which we live to follow Jesus. So it, there's some cost associated with that. And, you know, you might say, well, why would I do that? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm saved. I know Jesus as my Savior. I, I'm, I'm good. Why should, it, you know, why should I be dedicated? Why should I spend that cost? Why should I incur that cost that's associated with following Jesus? Why would I want to do that? And hopefully over the course of the next eight to ten weeks or so, we can talk about that and scripturally look at that and bring to our mind the mindset that says, I want to follow Jesus. So First of all, this morning I want to get started. I want to, uh, you know, I want I want you to think about who is God in your life. Who is God in your life? Is he, is he just somebody that you think of as as uh, you know creator of the world? Is it somebody that you think of only in a time of prayer, or is God somebody that you you understand is is ever present, is Almighty, is is all powerful, and and you know, is in control of, of the things that are taking place in our life. And, and so I want I to think about that just a little bit. In Genesis chapter 1, the first 31 verses of the Bible, uh, we see the creation. And, and so, you know, without a doubt, we, we must understand that God is a creator of the world in which we live, that he created, the, the Bible teaches us, created the world. He, 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 he made the earth. Uh, he made the atmosphere. He created the the rivers and the oceans. Uh, he you know he created the grass and the trees, uh, the fruit trees, and and he created the uh, the living creatures, the cattle. Uh, you know we think about horses. We think about all the the different animals. Those are God's creation, and and he created man and he, and he created a uh, woman to it, to occupy the garden, uh, the garden that he had created for them, that perfect place to. To live and, and so God is the creator of, of all that we know uh, with regard to natural creation. There are some things that man brings into the world, but most of them are, 
are evil and of, a, of sinful nature, but the, but the creative things are, are controlled by God. They have been brought into this world by God, and, and so uh, it's, it's good for us to understand there, there's a lot of different theories in this old world. Um, you can go to the, to the YouTube, you can go to the television set, and you will find somebody standing before you and, and telling you how the, the world uh, was created from a, a Big Bang theory. Uh, that this ex huge explosion uh, resulted in the creation of earth and, and human form. Uh, you'll find somebody teaching on evolution, how we have evolved from a, a, an ape or a monkey uh, status and, and how we evolved into becoming humans. Uh, but you know what God's Word tells us? And as a Christian, if we're going to be a follower of Christ, uh, we put our faith in what God has shared with us. And, and that, that plan says that we are created uh, by the hand of God, that he created the, the things of this earth that we just spoke of. And it says he created man, and, and he, 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 he put his uh, mouth over our nostrils and breathed into us the living spirit, the living soul. We became a living soul uh, through the, the creation, through the touch of God himself. And, and so that's, that's our platform in, in this world in which we live, is that this world is, is a creation of God, that he created uh, the earth, that he created humans, uh, he created you, he created me. We read in the, in the book of Jeremiah chapter 1, it says this, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. <clears throat> we, see, we see that the, the Lord, as he speaks to Jeremiah here, says that, hey, not only have I created you, but before you were in the womb, I, I knew you. I already knew who you were. I already had, had you created you as a creation. I sanctified you before you were born. I gave you direction in this life. And, and let me say this, it's not any different for you today than it was for Jeremiah back then. Now, God was using him, was, he was sanctifying him, he was setting him aside as a prophet, a, a particular position in that time and in that day, a prophet of God. And, and so maybe God is not directing us and calling us specifically into that type of work, but, but I tell you that God has purposed your life uh, with reason. You were born into this world, not by accident, uh, God fully was aware that you were coming into the world. It was by His touch. It was by His breath. Um, you were not accidentally born into this world, but you were created with purpose and brought into this world. And, and that's important for us to know as a, as a child of God, as a follower of Christ, that you are here intentionally. You're here with intent and, and with purpose. And, and that purpose that God has, has ordained upon your life he has equipped you. He has promised to walk with you. And, and the work that he is doing in you, he has promised to do that until the day of Jesus Christ. So God is not going to give up on you regardless. You may look at your life. You may be say, uh, Brother Mike, man, I'm 20 years old and, and, and I've not given God much of my attention. You may say, I'm 40 years old. You may say, I'm 60 years old and I've never really given God much of my attention, much of my heart. I tell you this morning, if you're still breathing, okay, if you're still here, if you're listening, uh, able to listen to this this message, this lesson, then God has not given up on you. God is not done with you. And, and the purpose that he has, has placed upon your life, it's not too late to get started in that direction. So number one, uh, God is our creator. Not only of the earth in which we live, the earth in which we walk, but the creator of you and of I. He has made us with purpose, and we need to we need to just check that box and say, I know that's who God is. Number two, God is a sustainer. I like a piece of scripture that I want to share with you out of Deuteronomy chapter 31. And I'm just going to read the first six verses. I, I Really, verse six is where I want to land. But uh, the first six verses, it says this, Then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel. And he said unto them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. And also, the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan, okay? The, 
the Israelites are finally getting ready to cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, the land God has promised unto them. In the last uh, study session that we just completed last week, um, we, we understood, we studied how the Israelites, they had been led out of Egypt by Moses. They had come across the wilderness and right to the edge of Canaan, right to the very edge of Canaan, the promised land. But they, um, in their minds and in their hearts, they decided that they could not take the place that God had prepared for them, that there were giants there. They were not able to do that. And so they turned their backs on God's plan and they wandered, the Bible says, in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation passed away. We know that the only two people were Joshua and Caleb out of that entire generation that crossed over into the, the promised land, crossed over into the land of Canaan. And we see at this point, Moses is, is saying to the Israelites, I'm getting ready to go. God has told me I'm not going to see that promised land. I'm not going to be able to cross over. He says, uh, but, but listen to as, as he goes on. He says, the Lord your God himself crosses over before you, okay? He says, so as you're preparing to go forward, God has promised to go over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you shall dis dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said, and the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites in their land when he destroyed them. The Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment which I have commanded to you. What Moses is saying is that, hey, God has a plan. God has prepared a plan. God is going to be, he's going to go there before you go there. He's going to take care of business before you get there. The Israelites were going to have to fight the fight, but God was going to prepare the battlefield. God was going to prepare for the fight, and it was truly in God's hands. And in our life today, that, that is reflective of our walk today. When we're children of God, God walks before us. God understands. Uh, he, he knows our tomorrow. He knows that today. He knows the day after tomorrow. He knows that today. He's already aware of all those things. Uh, I, I preached at a, a funeral this week and, you know, I shared with them that there is a time appointed already in God's hand uh, the day that we should breathe our last breath. God already knows that. God already knows how we're going to pass from this earth. God already knows how... You know, this, this life is going to come to an end, the day that it's going to come to an end. There, there's no mysteries in, in God's mind. It's, you know, he, he has a plan. He has a purpose. And so Moses, encouraging the Israelites, says, hey, be encouraged, for God leads the battle, okay? God leads the battle, and the same thing applies to your life. The things that are impossible to men, they're not possible. They're not impossible to God. They're possible with God. And so in verse 6, where I was headed here, it says this, Be strong and be of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. That is reiterated in the book of, of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 5. He will not leave you. He will not uh, forsake you. So we know that when we become a child of God, that the Spirit of God moves in, lives within us, and he has promised to never abandon us, to never leave us. He will be there whether we're in the midst of a valley, whether we're on the peak of a mountaintop. God has promised to be there with us. He is our sustainer. Number two, he is our sustainer. So we should know God as, as our creator. Amen. He, he is the one that made me. I'm here because of God. He is my sustainer. As I go into battles in this life, as I walk through the valleys, as I climb the mountain peaks, that God is there before me, that he walks with me, he walks before me, he has prepared the way. And then number three, he is a giver of every good gift. The good things that we count in life, uh, the blessings that we know, they are of the hand of God. They are by his touch. Uh, you may say, well, I've been able to work and I've been able to make a lot of money um, and I've been able to buy some good things. Number one, sometimes the things we perceive as good things are not good things. They are things that Satan uses to pull us away from God's will. Amen? That's just a fact of, of this old earthly life. There are things that we perceive as good that are truly not good things in our life. Um, number two is if you've been able to work and support your family and make a living and, and be able to meet the needs of your family, it's, it's only by God's grace. 
It's only by God's grace. His word says he is the giver of all of every good gift. James chapter 1 verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Amen? Every good thing that you have, every good thing that I have is by the grace of God. It's by His love. It's by His mercy. He is the giver of all good things. God is our creator. God is our sustainer. And God is the giver of every good gift that we have. So we want to be close to God. Amen? That's just, that just should be our, our desire but we're born in this flesh. The fleshly nature is, it pulls just the opposite of that. The flesh wants to, to satisfy itself, and therefore it is sin that keeps us from being in the place that God wants us to be, to being close to the Lord and, and fully trusting in Him and, and, and committed to Him. What gets in the way, it's, it's our sinful nature. And so uh, point two that I want to make this morning, point one is who is God in your life. Point two is that sin keeps us away from that God that we just spoke about. In Romans chapter 3, I'm going to make this point. I'm going to be rather brief here. I don't want to spend a lot of time <clears throat> because the good stuff is in point 3. But point 2 says that, that sin keeps us away from, we're, you know, away from God. And, and so in Romans 3 and 23, one of the most well-known verses, um, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Your pastor is a sinner. I am a sinner. You are a sinner. Now, now here's what we fight with. As religious people, we, we have a tendency to want to categorize sin, okay? Um, we have a tendency to want to say, well, that sin's really bad, and that sin's not too bad, and well, that sin, that, that's kind of okay. Number one, there's no sin that's okay in the eyes of God. Um, it's either sin or it's not. It's either sin or it's righteous. And if it's sin, then it's, it's no good in the eyes of God. Uh, but as religious folk, sometimes we have a tendency to be a lot like the Pharisees, to pick and choose uh, what we want to consider sin. And, and I'm just telling you that that's no good. In the book of James, it's chapter 2. And verse 10, it says that if we are guilty of one, that we are guilty of all. Let me, let me, I'm in that neighborhood. Let me just, uh, let me just share exactly what that says. I didn't write it down. James chapter 2 and verse 10 says this. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of the whole law. All right? So, if you, uh, if you, all these big wicked sins in your mind, if you stay clear of them, but this, this small sin, that it, it prevails in your life, and, and you've kind of just made that your favorite sin, you've accepted that, uh, guess what? You're guilty of everything. You're guilty of all. And what this really means is this, that, <clears throat> that we're either guilty or we're not guilty. And in the Bible, in the verse I just read, Romans 3 and 23, explains it very well. It says, for all have sin. Uh, if we get into 1 John, it says, if you say you have no sin, that the truth is not in you, okay? This morning, if you say, Brother Mike, I have overcome sin. I used to be a sinner, but I'm not a sinner anymore. God's Word says the truth is not in you, amen? That's not me telling you that, you know? I have enough struggles of my own. This old sinner has struggles of his own. I'm not telling you that you're a sinner, I'm telling you that God's Word says, if you say you have no sin, that the truth is not in you. We are all guilty. We're all guilty of being short of where God wants us to be. To, be, uh, to, to, to know the Word, uh, to hear the Word, and to not be a doer of it, to know to do good and to not do that, God's Word says is a sin. We often think about sin as being something detrimental or something that we're doing in our life that we shouldn't be. But I believe just as importantly, maybe more importantly, is the things that we should be doing that we're not doing for the cause of Christ, taking the love of Jesus to the world in which we live, that people might see Christ in us. Those are the things that's so important. And, and so often as, as church members, as church peoples, as God's family, we don't even think about that. We, we focus on not doing this or not doing that, but man, there's so much that God wants us to be doing for His cause. That's how people 
we see the witness in our life is it's not so much by what we don't do, but it's by what we do do. And uh, it's whenever we reach out and we share the love of Christ, that's what people see and that's what changes their lives. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the verse that says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm thankful for that. It, remo- it removes any confusion and it leads us, it builds us right up in, into chapter 6 and verse 23. It says, the wages of sin, the wages of that sin is death. Okay, spiritual death, eternal separation from Jesus Christ, comma, but the gift of God is eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. Man, praise the Lord. It don't get any better than that right there. The wages of sin is death, okay, but the gift of God is eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. God has made it possible for us to have victory over the sin debt that we owe, the wages that I owe because of, of, of the sin in my life. God has made it possible for me to have victory. I could not pay that sin debt, but his son lived on this earth for 33 years without sin, went to the cross of Calvary. Whenever he said it is finished, what was finished, he had taken on that task of carrying the sin debt of the entire world, and he had paid that debt through the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary, the perfect sacrifice, the one without sin, the perfect lamb, gave his life that we might, might have forgiveness through, through his sacrifice. And, and that's so important because God has provided the way uh, for you and for I to be part of his family. The God that we talked about, how, how do we become part of his family? The sin, it says, separates us and keeps us out of his family. How do we get there? And, and so we read, we, we just shared that Jesus gave his life on the cross of Calvary for us. But there's a way to be connected to God, and, and if we're going to follow Jesus, we've got to be connected. We've got to be connected to the Lord, and it tells us in John chapter 14 and, and verses 1 through 6. Let me just read uh, all six verses of this. Again, verse 6 is where I'm headed, okay? But I want to I give you a little bit of, of context with this. Jesus is speaking to the, 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 the uh, disciples. He says this, let, us, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled, okay? That, we're looking for peace, ain't we? We're looking for our heart not to be troubled. Jesus says, hey, let your heart not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, okay, for this eternity that we're speaking of. To, and, and so in verse 4, he says, And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And I love verse 5, Thomas says unto him, Thomas says, Hey, Lord, uh, I, I don't know what you're speaking of. I don't know the way. I don't know the place. Tell me more. I, stop what you're talking about and tell me more. I'm confused. And Jesus, in verse 6, he simply said this. He says, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man cometh unto the Father except by me. Okay? So it's only through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that is the only pathway that takes us to our Heavenly Father. There's only one pathway, and it's through Jesus, the Son of God. Okay, Jesus himself just told us that. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 14, he explicitly said, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man comes unto the Father except by me. So there's only one way. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourself, okay? <clears throat> that grace is the grace of God. And you've been saved by your faith, by your trust in grace, in God's grace, and that is not of yourself, it is a gift of God himself. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Your salvation is not through your works, it is through the grace of God. It's the fact that God loved you, that you might love Him. That God loved you, that He knocked on the door of your heart, that He has spoken to your heart, that He has convicted your heart of your need for Jesus Christ as as your Lord and as your Savior. And it's by God's grace, and it makes it so explicit, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. Man, Paul here in the book of Ephesians, he wanted to make it clear. Paul had come out of the, the, the background of, of the Pharisees, and, and he had, he had, the law had been so important, and works had been so important to Paul. 
And, and yet God opened his eyes. And, and Paul wants to make it so clear that it's not about works. It's not about uh, the deeds that you've done, the deeds that you accomplish, the good things that you do. That's not what is going to get you saved. What is going to make you part of the family of God is the fact that God loved you first. It's by God's grace and simply by your faith and your trust in what God's word tells us, okay? And, and let's, just, <clears throat> let's just look at that, uh, following this up. It, it, it's how to hook up with the Lord. How to hook up with the, with the Lord. And say, well, how difficult could it be? We just said it's not about your works. It's about your faith. By God's grace and your faith, okay? By your trust in the grace of God and his calling that he places upon your heart. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, it says this, okay? How do, how do we get hooked up with Jesus? I want to be hooked up with Christ. I want to walk with Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. How do I get hooked up? It's very simple. That if you confess with your mouth, again, this is Romans chapter 10, verse 9. How important it is that we understand this. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the grave, that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, that he bore our sin debt in its entirety for the world itself, that he bore that sin debt. He said, it is finished. He accomplished the task. He went to the grave. Uh, they took his life, and, and they placed him in the grave. And three days later, he arose victorious out of that grave. He sits alive and well by the right-hand side of the throne of God today. And, and so if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the grave, thou shalt be saved. That's what God's word tells us. Okay, it's not about your works. It's about the fact that you've got to trust that your heart has to be changed, that your heart has to go away from, from counting on the things of this world. And it has to count on the simple uh, gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus loved you so much he was willing to give his life on the cross of Calvary that you might have life through him. Okay, so your heart has to be adjusted your heart has to be touched and instead of placing your heart uh, and following the things of the world you say Jesus I trust in you I trust in you I want you in my life as my Lord as my Savior and you confess with your mouth you have you you talk to the Lord you, you, you audibly ask Jesus into your life and and God's word says that you become saved that you become saved now it takes you know, I, I, I don't want to, to mislead you, and I want to give you something to think about. Somebody could come down the aisle of this church, and, and we can kneel, and we can pray, and their heart may not be affected, okay? If their heart is not touched, if they're not making a, a, an honest decision to say, Jesus, come into my life, you know, sometimes that's an emotional time, and and so everybody's, everybody's reaction is a bit different. There's no right way to react. The only thing I know that is right is it must be a sincere change in your heart that says, I'm taking my, my heart and my eyes off the thing of this world, and Jesus, come into my life. I'm counting on you as my Lord and as my Savior. And, man, when we make that sincere uh, and honest uh, decision, we become a child of the Lord at that moment. At that moment, the Spirit of God moves in. God's Word says that our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Ghost. A piece of God Himself moves in and resides within us and walks with us, never to leave us, never to forsake us, and to begin to accomplish that purpose that God has for your life and, and for my life. So it's a beautiful piece of Scripture. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For verse 10, it says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. It's, with the, it's the decision that's made in your heart that brings you into the righteousness of the Lord. And with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. Just a couple verses that are so pure and so beautiful and, and yet so simple. Uh, and, I, and I pray that those verses are something that you will commit to your memory that you have experienced that, that you will share those verses, that you'll be placed 
in positions in your life to be able to share those verses with people who are asking you how to be saved. Man, if we're following Jesus, we're going to be a light that shines in the dark world. We're going to influence people. We're going to bring hope into people's lives, and we're going to have opportunity to share with them the gospel, the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. How beautiful that that, that, that uh, scripture is. You know, another piece of that, <clears throat> uh, with regard to being becoming followers of Christ, we become heirs with Jesus Christ. I just thought that was important. I wanted to make mention of that. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, it says this, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Okay? Uh, the spirit of God does not come into your life to bring fear, but to help you to overcome fear. Time and 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 time again, in God's word it says fear not. Fear not. Some of our lives are consumed with fear. I I know people, and and there's so many people that hide that, but but so many of our lives are consumed with fear. Uh, Whenever you are willing uh, to trust Christ um, as your Lord and your Savior, that's the first step. But when you're, you're willing to continue and you want to follow Jesus, one of the great benefits of following Christ is the peace, is the comfort, is the encouragement that he brings into our life. And as you bring that, that, that peace into your life, as you bring that comfort, that encouragement into your life, one of the things that begins to get pushed out is the fear that, that so often consumes us and the fear that we, we often live within the, afraid of this, afraid of that, health issues, financial issues, marital issues. And, and so one of the great blessings of following Christ is that the fruit of the Spirit that begins to come from our life begins to push things such as fear begins to push them out of our life. It says you did not receive the, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. Listen to this, of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. God becomes our Father at the point of salvation, at the point that, we, uh, that our heart uh, makes that choice, makes that decision to trust in Jesus Christ. We become a child of God, and, our, and, and God becomes our Heavenly Father. And it's a personal thing. It's an it's a Abba Father. It's, it's a love thing as we cry out into our, our Heavenly Father. And it goes on in verse 17. It says that we become heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus. Amen? Joint heirs with Christ. When I become part of God's family, I become a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And man, you know, as, as uh, in many ways, Christ ought to be one of those guys we, did, we want to fellowship with, we want to walk with, we want to hang out with, we want him to influence every portion of our life. We're heirs with Jesus. Let's walk with Jesus. And then finally, I, w- I want to... Um, out of the Gospel of John chapter 10, I want to share this verse. It says, my sheep, okay, as part of God's family, we become his sheep. We are his children. Um, and he says, my sheep, hear my voice. Amen. That spirit that lives within you, that Holy Spirit, that spirit that guides you, that spirit that directs you, we hear his voice, that small, still voice that leads us and that guides us, that encourages us. Whenever we're in the midst of that temptation that encourages us, when we're in the midst of the valley uh, and then we're covered with sorrow, that he brings that peace and he brings that joy, that spirit of God. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Great verse to base this entire study on. My sheep hear my voice, okay? We've always got the presence of the Lord in our life to lead us and to guide us. Always. We've read in two different places this morning where he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The Spirit lives within us, and and he guides us with his very voice. Now, it's not going to be an audible. It's not like you can pick up the telephone and hear that voice. But that Spirit that lives within us is going to be a holy guide uh, in our life. And so he says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Man, God knows you. He knows your struggles. He knows your victories. He knows your defeats. He knows when we're up. He knows when we're down, when we're discouraged, when we're happy. He knows all things. He's an all-knowing God. And then listen to the, after the comma, it says this, and they follow me. Okay? So for many of our Christian lives, 
we get saved, we become part of the family, but where we falter, where we stumble is in our following Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as we've, we, what, I, what I'm hopeful that we're doing is establishing our relationship, putting it in concrete, putting it rock solid that we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, that we can think of Jesus as the one that gave his life that I might have eternal life through him, that we think of Christ as the one, the great creator, the one that brings purpose into our life, uh, that, that helps us be mindful that we're not an accident, that we walk day by day with purpose in this life, that God has a plan for us, that he loves us, that he has not given up, that that plan is in effect until the day that we leave this earth or until Jesus comes back. And, and, and so God is an almighty God with a son that loved us so much that he was willing to give his life, that we might have eternal life through him. And that's who, that's who we, we are to follow. That's who we are to fellowship with, to walk with. And, and my, my desire is that through this study that we would have, that we would actually desire to walk with Jesus on a daily basis, that we would seek, we would seek his companionship, we would seek his fellowship. And, and I just believe for Christians, so often we don't do that. We live our life during, during the week and then, uh, on Sunday mornings, we want to come and we want to worship and be close to God, and then we kind of want to go back and do our own thing. And, and so the study over the course of the next couple months, man, it's going to be about what can we do, what should we do, what do we need to do in order to follow Christ, to have a greater desire uh, to follow Jesus. And man, He's given us the Spirit as a guide, a guide into truth. He's given us His Holy Word He's given us the church. The next three lessons are going to evolve around those three topics. I don't know for sure what, what uh, order they're going to be in, but, man, it's a great, it's a great way to start and, and to continue uh, in this study and, and hopefully to affect our life in a way that causes us to be better followers of Jesus. Wrapping up this lesson, <clears throat> hope you stayed with me right through till now. Acknowledging God as an almighty, all-knowing, and ever-present God. This is the application part of this. What do I need to do, based on what we've studied this morning, what do I need to do? We need to acknowledge God as an almighty, all-knowing, and ever-present God. He's our creator. He's our sustainer. He's the giver of every good gift. And he's, just, he's, he's God. He's our, our God. Acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Savior, having died and risen again, victorious over the grave. He died that your sin debt might be paid. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. There is no other way except through Jesus Christ. Come to know him as your Lord and your Savior. We talked about that this morning, step by step, confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart, uh, knowing uh, Christ, act, act, asking him to be your, your trusted Savior, and, and making that step in order that you might be saved. And so we acknowledge Christ as our Savior. And then finally, acknowledge your failure and God's love through his grace and through his mercy on a day-by-day -day basis. I need to acknowledge my failures. I need to acknowledge the fact that I'm broken. I can't do it on my own. I can only do it through the, the strength of the Holy Spirit, through God's power, through God's direction in my life. If I try to do it on my own, if I sit, push God aside and try to walk on my own, I'm going to stumble, I'm going to fall, I am going to mess things up. But God has said, man, I will be there with you. I will, you know, decision by decision, choice by choice, day by day, I'm going to be there. I want to walk with you. Help me, Lord, to follow you. Help me to be a follower of Jesus Christ. In, in Jeremiah chapter 29, the Israelites had been taken captive into Babylon. Uh, they were there for 70 years. Uh, in, in verse 11, it says this, God speaking to them. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Think about this, God speaking to you. It says, the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for me. Today, the Israelites had failed. Man, they had stumbled. They had turned their back upon God time and time again. They had chosen to worship the idols of this world. They had taken their eyes off God and put them on the things of this world. Man, it's so easy to fall into that trap. It's so easy to, to place our focus on, on other things other than what God's trying to do in our life. The Israelites were guilty of that. 
And, and so what we see is, is in this captivity, these 70 years of captivity, God speaks to them through Jeremiah. He says, hey, I have a plan for you. I have a hope for you. I know what my thoughts are towards you. They're not thoughts of evil, man. They're thoughts of peace. They're thoughts of encouragement. They're thoughts of comfort. And, and so know that God is, is those same things, that, that same thought applies to you and I. God has good things for us. He has a hope for us. He hasn't given up on us. And, and you know, what he seeks is that we would just walk with him. Let me give you just a little bit more of this. He says in verse 12, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. He was just looking for the fellowship that he desired from the Israelites. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. How beautiful is that when we seek God with all of our heart, when we turn our eyes, take our eyes off the things of the world and place it upon it. He has promised to be there for us, to be there. Uh, to, to be the, he hasn't stopped loving you. He hasn't stopped loving me. And then finally in Romans 8 and 28, I want to share one last verse with you. And we know that all things work together for the good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Folks, we don't always understand everything. Amen? There is things going on in, in my life, things going on in, in my friend's life, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, that, that I don't understand, but God does. God, God knows all about it. Uh, His hand, He is that almighty God. He is the all-knowing God. I often think about a painting that God is the, is the one that is making this painting. He's the painter, you know, and what we see is all these little pieces, all these little specks of the painting, and, and sometimes they don't make sense. They, they just don't make sense to us in our in our earthly mind, in our, our earthly flesh, the body which we reside in. And, and so t- sometimes we don't understand what's going on. But God is the, God is the author, uh, is the maker, the creator of this great painting that he's doing. And, and all those little specks and all those little pieces, they fit together according to his plan. And at the end, you know, uh, I'm not even sure how... When we get to heaven, if we'll understand some of the things we haven't, I think that in our mind we won't even care about some of the things out of this earthly life that maybe we haven't understood. But I think, you know, at the, at the end of the day, God's portrait is a beautiful portrait uh, because he is the creator. He is the author of all things. And, and so it's, it's a, it, that beautiful portrait. And sometimes we don't understand the, the bits and pieces, but he gives us scripture that we might trust, that we might have faith in him and who he is, that we might be willing to follow him. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. God, your word is so good, so true, so eternal. God, let us build our lives around your word. I pray that in this study over the course of the next eight or ten weeks or so, dear Father, that you would just open our eyes and reveal to us some awesome things, dear God, that you want us to put into our life, some awesome scripture that you would reveal that to us that would change our life and draw us closer to you, that we might indeed have this great desire and walk closer to you, follow closer to you than we ever have before in our life. Change our lives, Lord, as as only you can in a way that would be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' precious name, I ask these things. Amen.